Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining me on 21st Century Native Leaders. My name is Peter Deswood III, and I am here with Director Loretta Sarah Todd. Do you prefer Loretta or Sarah? Loretta's good. Sarah? Okay. L Loretta's Direct good. Loretta's good. Loretta? Yeah. Okay. So, so Loretta directed the movie uh, Monkey Beach, which is an amazing movie, by the way. I watched it this past weekend, and there's some really good themes that I like in there. The movie's amazing. I love the connection to spirituality. And my, my favorite, which reminds me of one of my aunts, is uh, Mama O. I, I made, you know, had a really good connection with her because it reminded me of one of my, my aunt Sandra. So looks it, it, in appearance and the way she talks and everything as well. But thanks for being on the show. Yeah, welcome. I'm so honored. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's so good to talk to you, meet you, and, and be able to share about Monkey Beach. Absolutely. So talk with me a little bit about yourself, um, tribal affiliation, uh, where you come from. So my family is originally from the St. Paul de Métis and the Whitefish Lake First Nations, which is sort of in northeastern um, Alberta in, in here in Canada. And um, we also have connections to the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. And then also we were one of the first uh, original families at the uh, at the Métis um, Nation in, in um, Winnipeg in Manitoba. That's about it. I mean, we, we, we do honor um, um, clan, but I have to say we ha it's not something we practice of late in our family. My family is quite disjointed, unfortunately. But I do believe that our clan is wolf. Wow, that's awesome. And I know a lot of Indigenous people around the world do... Uh you know, live by their clans, and I used to live up in Wisconsin, and the seven recognized tribes, tribes up there all, all had clans as well, so uh, so would you describe yourself as a an urban Indian, or, or a reservation, a res kid, how would you describe yourself? I would say we're urban, totally, like probably second generation but urban native. Um, our, our, my, my father worked in the oil fields um, in Alberta, so we lived, we kind of moved around to the towns where he would have worked. And then eventually uh, we moved to the city. Um, our family lost their traditional territory lands when the government kind of disenfranchised the land. So my grandparents and our family moved to the city, to Edmonton. Um, it was sort of like a, a small urban native community, which has grown, has grown now. I mean, in, in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, Manitoba, there's very large indigenous uh, um, people, numbers of people in the cities there and also in Vancouver. Um, eventually, I moved to Vancouver. So most of my adult life I have spent in Vancouver. Um, and I've been very fortunate that so many um, amazing People here on the coast have embraced me and welcomed us, even though I'm not in, you know, my original territory. I'm in their territory, so it's been um, it's been quite a journey. I I do feel, um, you know, we would go visit relatives on the res, and you know, we would go back to the land. And in the summertime, um, when Dad wasn't working, we would, you know, he'd pitch the old trapper tent, and we would spend summer so sort of like camped out and getting a lot of mosquito bites, but. <laughs> But um, it was, um, yeah, there was good times and, and there's not always so good times, but, you know, I certainly um, um, cherish, you know, my parents who are both gone now and my grandparents and you know, all my relatives really are all gone now. But, um, you know, it's uh, some of them tragically because of the urban res um, kind of experience, but nonetheless, it's, uh, you know, it's brought me to where I am now, you know, it's made me stronger. So. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And you are right. There's a lot of intricacies and issues and challenges that come from urban and that shift in between. So talk with me a little about some of the highlights uh, of your career so far. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, um, when I did come to Vancouver, I came as a very young, I was a runaway actually. And um, eventually I was um, feeling lonely and, and wanted to meet up with more Indigenous people uh, in a kind of a safe way. So I went and um, I went and uh, volunteered at the local Friendship Centre. And there I met the late Len George, who is one of Chief Dan George's, uh, the late Chief Dan George's sons. And I was very fortunate that Len was one of those kind of guys that just accepted you as you are, no judgment. 
you know, um, how can, you know, how can, um, you know, he help you excel and, you know, find out who you really are. And so I um, feel like one of my highlights was the fact that the um, late Chief Dan George family, um, um, you know, agreed and asked me if, you know, were, were, were kind of let me tell the story of their father, um, Chief Dan George. So that was a real highlight. I was so fortunate to do that. Um, also, um, I guess, you know, there's nothing that I'm not, well, there's one documentary I walked away from because of uh, government or the, the the broadcaster's interference. They basically wanted me to lie and distort history. Um, but other than that, I would say that every film I've made, I feel good about in some way. I feel I've learned something and I hope I've given back to the people in some way and the people in the films. Uh, whenever I made a documentary, I've made documentaries like my first was a learning pass, which was with um, this amazing group of Indigenous uh, elders who have been very significant in changing Indigenous education in, in uh, Alberta and in Canada. Um, people like Dr. Olive Dickinson and Dr. Ann Anderson and Eve Cardinal. And I remember when I asked them, you know, uh, it was my first film, my first big film, because I had made, you know, small experimental films or small films with Native organizations. That, so I asked them, what kind of film did you want to make? And they said, hopeful film. So every time I've made a film like Forgotten Warriors, which was with Native war veterans here in Canada, Hands of History, which was with a group of Indigenous women artists, uh, The People Go On, which I made with the Kainai and, you know, in Southern Alberta, um, part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Every time I asked them, what kind of film do you want me to make? And they said, hopeful. So I think the highlight is the fact that I did my best to make hopeful films. And I think Monkey Beach is another example of that. Even though we're dealing with trauma, even though we're dealing with you know intergenerational trauma, I still like to think it's a hopeful film. Um, I also, I feel really proud of the fact that I've been making children's television. So I made a series called Nahiwe Tan, which is sort of for little kids um, to teach them the kind of the introduction to Cree, Niwa, which is, you know, my family's language. And they, and it was also about making good choices in the city. So it wasn't just about, so again, you know, making it in Vancouver. There's a sizable Cree and Métis community here in Vancouver um, and Surrey, sort of in the out, outskirts of Vancouver as well. So we're living not in our territory. So how do we learn our language? And so this was a way of saying we can have to honor the people whose territory we're in, but we can also learn our language and we can make good choices that we live in the city. So that was one series I was really, really proud of. And then um, recently I've been doing Coyote's Crazy Smart Science Show, which is a series about Indigenous science. And we're in production with our third year, which is a little hard because of COVID. So we're going very, very slow. Um, um, but the, that I feel very proud of because it was something that was really important to me because, you know, they say that we don't have science. And I know that's changing now. Now we're say they say we have science, but um, I thought it was really important for our people, our youth and children, to see themselves um, and see or see themselves as scientists, as, as, because that's who we are. We, we, we you know, we, we're observers. We learn. We learn from story and plays. We, we are natural scientists. As John Harrington, who's in the series, says, you know, we're we're, we're natural scientists. So I, I would say I'm pretty proud about everything. They're all highlights. Um, I guess, the, like I say, there was that one project I walked away from when, when the broadcaster said, um, you have to lie. <laughs> or, you know, their, their idea of history was a lie. My idea of history was, was the truth. So that was one I walked away from. Yeah, that must yeah. be tough to, to walk away when there's conflicting view on history. And I think that's one thing that's pretty powerful. So how did you uh, start directing movies? Talk to me about that career path. Well, I was working, I had worked with Native organizations, I had worked with, um, and again, is that idea of how do I be in someone else's territory? Like, how do I um, not sort of assume I can speak with the people here or, you know, um, and there's very strong nations here, it's just very little Squamish and Musqueam here in Vancouver, they're all, you know, urban um, um, First Nations. And so how do I, you know, um, how, how do I, what's my role? Like, how do I find a role here? 
And so one of the things I kept thinking was, how do I put myself in service to, to the people? And I, I also saw that a lot from, you know, people in my family, but also, you know, Len, Len George, that was his life. Len just gave, put himself in service to the people. And, and um, so it was important for me to find that. And I'd always had this kind of strange visual sense. Like I always had this sense that I could, I would see many, I would see things in my mind. I would, uh, and I used to watch old movies with my, my mother. And I always had this idea of, you know, how would I make that film? And funny, we, he, she and I would talk and we watched the movie. She says, well, I wouldn't have done that. I would have done this. And, you know, so there was always this kind of, uh, and you know, and then in Canada, you also you see the National Film Board. You know, and all those documentaries I mentioned were all done with the National Film Board. And I wouldn't be a filmmaker today if it wasn't for the National Film Board. But when I was growing up, the National Film Board films were still very much that voyeuristic, ethnographic, you know, gaze at us. And as a kid, when we watched them in schools, it would always make me feel uncomfortable because. You know, there would just be a few native kids in the class, and I would always feel like, oh, they're talking about us. They're trying to if kids snickered, they'd be snickering at us, and and um, so I always wanted to find a way to sort of change that narrative. And somehow along the way, I just decided to go to film school. <laughs> um, I, I I was working full time, and I and I somehow because. I guess I've been a workaholic. I went to my manager and I said, hey, I want to go to film school. I have to apply to get in. If I get in, can I, I still have a family to support. I, I, I can't just quit and go to school. And, and he said, oh, well, okay, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. And so for the first year I worked full time and still went to film school. And, um, and then you have to apply at the end of the first year at the particular film school. I went to see if you could go on the second year. And I applied and I was able to go on the second year. So I had to basically leave my full time job. and. But it was really, that's sort of what got me, you know, um, I guess in the door in terms of making films is, is, is going to film school. That was a lonely place because there really was only me um, as an Indigenous woman back in the day. It wasn't that long ago, but it still is still, you know, another friend of mine who I became friends with later who was coming up, who was a little bit before me. And then there was a woman who was for, for a while, but she decided to leave. It wasn't for her, but. It was an experimental film school, of all things. Um, it was Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver. Um, but that gave me a lot of freedom. Like, no one was over my head saying, this is how you have to make a film. It was like, okay, here's the equipment. Here's the lighting. Here you have to, you know, do this. Here you have to do that. Here's some examples of films. Now go make some films. And so there was a lot of freedom, um, which was good, because that allowed me to kind of find my voice. Wow, that's powerful that you were allowed to experiment <laughs> on your own and use your voice. That's it's powerful. Any uh, projects you're currently working on? Um, well, we're finishing third season of well, we're trying. We're in the middle of production with Coyote State Crazy Smart Science Show, which is a little hard because of you know COVID. But I was very very fortunate because I've, over the years I've almost I've always made sure of hiring indigenous crew or mentoring or giving, you know, our people an opportunity to work in productions. So I've built this community, not just me. I mean, we've built this community in Vancouver um, on the, well, on the West Coast where there was a number of indigenous people who I've hired as directors or cinematographers who happen to have families. So they have their own kids. So in coyotes, in Coyote Science, a big part of our, our every episode is we have a group of kids go on quests. So they go on these science quests to either speak to elders to get knowledge, you know, or they they do an experiment or they go and find out things about, you know, the theme of that particular episode. So it's really fortunate. So there's enough of our, enough of the people I've worked with over the years who have families. So they are filming with their kids in their bubbles. So we don't have to expose anybody. We don't have to bring crews into anybody's First Nations and put, you know, elders at risk. Um, it's this, you know, the, the cinematographer or, uh, you know, in one case, uh, Chisa Warbus and her, and her husband, Calvin, he's the cameraman, she's the, she's the director, and they've, they've got, you know, a couple kids, and her mother and grandmother are in her bubble. So they were able to film their sequences about, um, in this case, the technology of cedar. Um, so that's sort of what we've been doing right now. It's slow, you know, because we still have to, um, there's a lot going on. I'm sure you've noticed in Indian country, 
there's been a lot of um, grief, a lot of losses. And so, um, you know, we have to slow down sometimes to, to when people have things that go on in their lives, which we would do anyways. Um, but also because we can't go and say, okay, we're blocking off six weeks or eight weeks or whatever to shoot. We, it's not the same. We're shooting a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, so, but we're getting there. And I, I have a really amazing group of people where I'm working with. Um, and so I'm really, really um, excited about that. And I also have an animated series um, called the Tannis and Skylar that I'm trying to develop. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I need to have some dedicated time just to focus on it. But um, it's something fun that I want to do. Um, and then, um, I, you know, I have other features that I'd like to make and TV series that I'd like to do. Uh, you know, it's it's a really good time now for people, and 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 it's I'm really so proud and excited about all the work that's coming out. Um, for me, it's been a, a little different path because I guess I've been I was a little bit ahead of the curve, so I was one of those people who was knocking on doors and not always getting answers. So I had to go my own way and you know create my own series, um, but it's still you know so I you know I just have to kind of like just really. Not that get discouraged and just keep finding a way to tell the stories I need to tell. Wow, it sounds like you can select uh, movies you want to direct and you work on the ones you like. So talk with me about the role of a director. I always hear about directors in movies, but I don't necessarily know what they do. Well, I'm a little bit different because I produce and direct and write. So, um, um, I, you know, I... I'm doing, I'm raising the money, I'm, you know, hiring crew, I'm, you know, thinking all the logistics, so um, um, I don't think I've ever, well, that's not entirely true, but I made documentaries with the film board I, I directed, and um, often kind of took a, a, a uncredited role as producer in terms of helping to organize things, but um, but in the, in this now, I, you know, I pretty well produced all my own work, so I'm doing a lot of those logistics. Um, of making it all happen but at the same time I'm all so, and, and often I'm writing you know Coyote Science I write a lot of the scripts Mike Beach I was one of the co-writers and had written many versions of the scripts in the past but a director you know it's interesting every director I guess is a little different I mean every director has their own philosophy and their own, own way they come to storytelling for me I have to, because I guess I was sort of a little head of the curve, and there I was, you know, one of not too many people back in the day in Canada um, being an Indigenous woman filmmaker. I felt like I had to be, work twice as hard, you know, because nothing, I couldn't, you know, I heard stories of uh, non, like, white women, non-Indigenous women who were directors, and, you know, we, there was these rumors where, oh, well, you know, the cinematographer made that film, or, you know, all these kind of disparaging remarks to, to basically dismiss their accomplishment or somehow criticize their accomplishment. So to me, it was like really important that no one could say that about me. It was like, I'm going to work twice as hard. I am going to do, uh, you know, work, be twice as prepared. I'm going to be, you know, even more focused, you know, so that no one can say, oh, she didn't know what she was doing. So I spend a lot of time visualizing the story. Um, I look, watch a lot of other films. I, I think about the visions and visuals I have in my head. I like to go to the locations where we're going to film and sort of just sit with them and think about well, how would it work, how to move within this space. Like, what would it look like with the camera moving here, moving there? You know, what, what's the way to tell the story? Um, and then I, you know, I even have, you know, I'm not like, the great filmmakers who have their notebooks and you can, they have these detailed drawings because they're great, great artists on top of being great filmmakers. I don't quite have that. I have a little stick man, you know, I, I, but, um, but nonetheless, I, you know, I also have kept notebooks over the years, like for instance, for Monkey Beach, where, you know, cut and paste pictures out, you know, that I think, you know, could influence me or inspire me. Um, I think about, um, I have to always, because it, it's been a while, when you're making children's series, you know, it's a little bit say, more straightforward, but going into a feature film, you have to think about what lens, is it a 50 mil, is it, you know, do you want wide, do you want close, what, what's the depth of field, you know, you, you have to kind of be technically adept, which I feel was good having gone to film school where they kind of left me alone, so I shot my own films 
uh, at that film school. So I, you know, became fairly familiar with the camera, but every time I just still feel the need to re-educate myself. So, you know, fortunately nowadays there's a lot of tutorials online and, you know, a lot of ways to kind of go back and re re acquaint myself with, you know, what does a frame look like when it's 50 milliliters? What does it look like when it's 75? Like all the different ways that the story will be told um, and how the lens is critical to that. So I'm, I'm doing that. Um, I'm also, I, I like to storyboard. Um, again, my storyboards are kind of, well, a little bit more than a stick man. <laughs> a, little, a little bit, a little bit more than that, but you know, not, not too, not too much more, but at least it kind of gives the cinematographer an idea of where this person will be in the frame, you know, foreground, background, what, you know, and then I also, um, I really, one of the lessons I learned years ago from more seasoned directors and producers is I remember asking, you know, because a lot of, you know, bless their hearts, Canadian filmmakers um, make these Canadian films that, you know, are pretty, they have a style, they have their look, but they're kind of slow. And I remember asking an American producer one time, like, what, what do you think about Canadian filmmaking? And he said, well, you know, the problem with Canadian filmmakers is they don't block. So there is no sense of movement within the frame and the actors roll within that frame moving to the next shot and, you know, how, how you get someone from there to there, which creates a very, an energy and a, dyna, a dynamic within the storytelling. So that's something else I had to learn is how do I block the scene? Like, how do I have the actor and actress move within the scene? How do I have the camera move within the scene? And that was also something that, um, you know, you think about, you know, you have to. And, and you have to be prepared. I mean, you have to be prepared to improvise and who knows what's going to happen on set. But you have to be prepared because you never know. You, you know, you need to be able to show up and tell the actors where, to, where they're going to move. You know, where they can't, you know, uh, you know, how they're going to sit like in the scene in Monkey Beach with the, at the, around the campfire, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to have everybody in a semicircle. This is, you're going to sit here, you're going to sit there, you know, I'm going to have two cameras or the scene where when Lisa comes out of the bedroom and she hears the, gets the call, you know, um, about her brother, you know, I'm going to have her come down the hall. I'm going to have, there was a partition there so I could come around there. And then I'm going to, you know, be wide. And then I know I'm going to go uh, to slow-mo, which means I ha we have to change the, you know, the camera speed to be able to get that slow-mo. So I know that then we have to switch, you know, set things up again. You know, I know, you know, all those kinds of things you have to think out in advance. And yet you have to be prepared for if they don't work out. Because I don't know how many cinematographers, you know, times you think, oh, this is so good. And then my cinematographer says, well, it's not going to quite work, Lou. <laughs> Okay, well, got to do it this way then. So you know, and you you you, you talk with them, and Sterling, who worked on Coyote, uh, Monkey Beach with me, very very um, supportive. So it was my first feature, as, as prepared as I I may have been. Um, so he sometimes would say, "Oh, Loretta," you know, and I would make sure stepping aside with him and going, "Okay, this, this is what I want to do, but it doesn't seem to be quite working. How do we come up with a better solution?" Um, and then you have to think about the actors and the storytelling. So all these things are influencing the stories and influencing the actors, but then you have to think, well, what, how do I be with them? Like, how do I, you know, direct them and yet at the same time, let that character come out of them, let them, you know, give them their own sovereignty, if you like, within the telling of that character within the story. And one of the things, we didn't have a lot of time for rehearsal on Monkey Beach. We had like really one day of rehearsal. Um, so what do we do? And I remember, and this kind of goes back to Len in a way, and other people are, you know, people's great orators and storytellers I've heard over the years, who really seem to have a sense of energy. Like they understand the energy, they you know, understand how energy works within a room, within storytelling and that and you see it you know it's good. so the other thing is is there was this idea of creating uh you know you could call it a sacred space so you do your own ceremony or and you invite others into that place if, if it's necessary like you know we smudged and prayed at the beginning of the film but how do we i create this safe space and i guess that comes from 
all those things being done, all those storyboards, all those things being worked out so that there's a safe space, so that there's a, there's a comfort, there's an ease, there's a calmness so that the actors can find where they have to go to be able to tell that story. And, um, you know, I like to, you know, I, I, that's, that's the next part. And, you know, maybe it's partly my maturity, you know, I'm not a kid. Um, I've made, I've been enough around sets. I've been working enough, you know, so that maybe there's a confidence there that the actors pick up on so that they know that I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to make them look bad. I would never let them make look bad. I would only always try to make them look the best they could. And that, um, you know, sort of the other thing that you're thinking about. So, you know, you're also setting up the shot, then you're asking, you know, and you have to go and, you know, trust them too. You can't just say, literally, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. I want you to cry here. I want you. It's really kind of um, this um, sort of a symbiotic thing where what's in my mind and my heart in terms of the life of that character somehow it's communicated to them and their idea of that character and their heart and their mind sort of comes together. And that's sometimes magic. You can't really, you can do all those things to prep all that, but sometimes it's just a magic. And then there's all the endless editing and, you know, the, the, the post part of, you know, you're there and, you know, with the editor, you're there with the, the sound, you're there with the composers, you're there with, you know, making choices for the music, all those things that, you know, are still, um, you know, to bring the film to completion. Wow, it sounds like a quite a bit, especially if you're writing, producing, and directing. And I think that's the role of, of I guess, a, a good actor, a good producer. I mean, just just seeing that those dy dynamic positions and how they interact. So it's pretty powerful. So talk with me about Monkey Beach. You know, I wanted to add one more thing before we go on to Monkey Beach. You know, one of the things I learned was this idea. Remember years ago, um, I, you know, I guess, you, I'm sure you know Victor Maceispa, you know, the Hopi uh, video artist, photographer. I remember him, we having a talk, discussion about the oral tradition and him saying, you know, it's not our job to replicate oral tradition. Films and television can't replace the oral tradition. But, you know, it made me think, but, you know, how do I draw on the oral tradition, you know, and one of the things, this speaks actually to Monkey Beach, one of the things, and I think hopefully all my films, is that our ancestors, our elders are so smart, they weren't making our tradition because we didn't know how to write, you know, put things, because we what we did, some of us did have, you know, written, written um, languages, but they knew that the whole process of memory is so critical to our philosophy. And they knew that, you know, memory had to be, um, you know, given support. So if these genealogies had to be remembered, these histories had to be remembered, um, you know, they, they embedded them in song and dance and, and richness of, of theater and the richness of, you know, art. And so to me, one of the things I try to do in my filmmaking is make the films as rich and, and, you know, for, lo for lack of a better word, the, the sensual. So the idea that our senses are, you know, our eyes and our hearing and our, you know, all of the senses that we have to try to make them as, as alert um, as I can um, in terms of that experience of the film. So, so th that has always been a guiding principle for my work. So in the making of Monkey Beach, that was sort of, you know, what I was trying to achieve, how to try to make the film as beautiful, um, to make the film as hypnotic, if you like, in terms of the experience of that world, to make the film as immersive. That's another part of the oral tradition. It's almost like we become immersed in those times, those other times. You know, um, my dear old late friend, Doreen Jensen, used to tell me she was a uh, Gitsan, and she was in my film, Hands of History. She used to tell me when, when her relatives told her stories when she was growing up, it was like, she would be there. She would feel like she was in there. And when she was a little kid and someone gave her a pop-up book, the pop-up book was like, oh, that's like t the story I hear. That's like what I feel when I've been, you know, being told these stories. It's like, you know, I, I'm in that 
world. Like it's like you know. So later on in her art, she created a giant pop up book <laughs> to kind of like bring you back to the longhouse where she she uh, she remembered. So in a way, that's you know. So that's what I was trying to do: create this beautiful, immersive experience. So that, but bring you in slowly, so that this is not your territory. You know, this is someone else's t territory, someone else's life, lived experience, someone else's, you know, um, you know, sovereignty. So you have to come slowly and respectfully into that place, which isn't always the way the Western filmmakers work, right? Western film is you got to hit them hard, get in there, you know, let's get to the action, let's get to the story, let's get to the conflict, you know, let's resolve the conflict. But instead, to me, it was really important to come in in that way, you know, and again, even though I'm not from this territory, you know, um, I've been in that lot, fortunate enough to be invited into enough longhouses and other events where often the drums will come from outside. So they'll come in and they'll carry carry somebody in and, and the drums will be way off in the distance and they'll come closer and closer and closer. And then, you know, the, 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 it starts to, it happens, we're all there. And so for me, in a way, Monkey Beach, that's how I sort of started to film. Let's come in really slowly and then we're in the story and um that's been you know to be honest that's part of the reason why some non-indigenous people have kind of been perplexed by the film they're kind of oh well start slow but our people are like oh my god you know they get it <laughs> yeah i agree with that like you know you whenever you're explaining i could tell how the character development with the flashbacks and how she came back to the the reservation or the territory and and then the story the story started to unravel and i really liked it and like that and i think he did a really good job explaining that in, in the movie so just a little bit more on that so was it challenging to capture all the various social issues that first nations or indigenous people face in, in canada well you know the film is based on the book monkey beach by eden robinson so in the book, there is a lot of fractured family. There's a lot of integrational trauma. There's there's a lot of um, you know things that are a part of our lives, right? You know, the, you know the consequences of colonization. You know, it's there's 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 a lot of uh, you know trauma in the community. But in the book, she never. It's all more how it affects the kind of the spirit of people. It's not like graphic, in your face, you know, detailed scenes of these traumatic moments. At least not, it's not how I experienced them, you know, uh, when I experienced the book. So it was really important for me to think about how do I, how do I honor are people who have gone through trauma, and you know, I've had my own, you know, my family, my intergenerational trauma, and personal trauma, and so on. But how do I honor that and protect the sovereignty of the character, you know, and of, and, and not re-traumatize people? I mean, I think that's something you know I've learned from, particularly you know, women who have been um, very active in helping heal. In the indigenous community, um, with respect to you know what our women have had to endure, and I remember a lot of them saying things like, you know, we shouldn't be creating work that re-traumatizes. Um, we should be thinking about what are the consequences of the stories and the images that we tell. We have to be honest. We have to tell our truths. But how do we? And if we do have to go into those like heavy places, you know, how do we? You know, my late my late friend Vera Manuel did a play about residential school survivors and she used to do at the end there was counselors always there you know for people who would you know who might have been triggered and her storytelling was actually very very gentle too she she took the truth but she didn't and she told the hard truths but she didn't kind of like uh, exploit i guess is the word um so you know i've always been conscious of that so um I wanted to tell a story where we're dealing with, you know, um, well, and, you know, there's residential school, you know, the, one of the characters has was abused by the priest. And then in his adulthood, he became an abuser. And 
Um, that's what's sort of at the core of the actions of, of uh, the main character, Lisa's brother, is to as a revenge, if you like, of that of that of that abuse, you know, on his fiance. So how do I how do I go there? And you know, the book gives you a lot of direction, but at the same time, I had to think, and this is a question that's come up recently. Um, I attended a talk by the by Duke Redbird, who's you know great elder here in Canada, poet, smart person. And Duke was talking about science and technology because of the work I do in science and technology. Is it wise? You know, thinking about you know what we do and, and you know, and so I think about that too. Is it wise? What is the best way to? heal what's the best way to bring people into this story what's the best way to give space for those people who've experienced trauma um and so i i was very conscious of those things in making my decisions to tell the story and and yet at the same time i was also very conscious of the fact that there has to be some kind of um go you know some going somewhere with that right so even if i went more graphic which i didn't um if i, I I still have to go somewhere. I can't just leave people there in their trauma and re-traumatize. I have to find some space for them to be able to go beyond that. And so, you know, I, 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 you know, I made a lot of hard decisions. You know, part of the problem was, of course, the script. I had a much longer script at various times, like 140, 150 pages. And I kept being told by the funding agencies, well, that, you know, you're never going to be able to make a film that long, Loretta, you'd never get the budget. So I was very conscious of how I was going to do that. Like, how am I going to, you know, so I had those things that came out. I wouldn't say with the longer versions were any more graphic, but there was certainly probably more conflict, if you like. But in paring it down, it was actually probably a good process because it gave, it gave me, and, you know, it made me more to think about love. <laughs> Like, how do I give love to the characters? How do I give love to, you know, and then the actors give love to the characters? How do I give love to the audience? Because that's one of the things we need for healing. And so I was very conscious of that. And again, it goes back to the beauty of the film, the beauty of the, you know, the music and the, and, and the, the place where we are. But the other thing I was really aware of is this idea that, you know, and I, I, I don't pretend to have be the expert on these things. There's people with much great knowledge, and I, I, you know, forgive me. I hope I at least honor them with the amount of knowledge I have of this. But those people who have medicine powers, which this character Lisa has been struggling with her whole life, um, they have to go on these journeys, um, and often these journeys take them to places that you know I could never go, right? Because I don't have that kind of medicine but they have to go on these journeys to be able to then be able to to be strong for the people and so i was very conscious of the fact that even if you know we aren't medicine people in the same way that lisa is we still have medicine and it's really really important for you know us to embrace that medicine and i really wanted that feeling in the film so that everybody in the audience could say yes i can embrace my medicine lisa embraced her medicine and I can embrace my medicine. Um, I may not be have the supernatural, you know, powers that Lisa has, but I have medicine within. And so I think that's how I dealt with it. It was okay. We have trauma. We still have trauma. We have intergenerational trauma. But let's embrace our medicine, of which love is one. I mean, Lisa acts really, truly of love. She everything she does is love for her family, you know, for her brother, for her territory. Um, and you know, how, you know, to, to use that as, as, uh, as something, the, the book does get into some of the more outside issues around those things. And she explains them probably in, in you know, um, Eden's very unique way of storytelling. So she'll kind of, the character suddenly you'll be in the moment and then suddenly she'll be explaining something, you know, but in, in her amazing way of explaining it. But I wanted to kind of stay in that world and, and, you know, that residential school scene, some, pe some people have told me that that's one of the few times they've seen is Indigenous people seen on screen, Indigenous people talking to Indigenous people about residential school without having to explain it all, 
you know, uh, you know, let white people, you know, they all say, oh, well, we didn't know and feel like you have to, you know, do all that work for them. It's our moment. It's our moment of, of, uh, you know, ex talking about that, talking about that and what it means in our lives. I tell you everything you just talked about, like I, I definitely could relate to the characters and, you know, there, there was, like you were saying, you didn't have to have someone there that you had to explain a lot of this trauma to, right? You kind of just know it just being in you know, indigenous communities. And I think that's what's, that's one thing that was really powerful about the movie. So how can people watch the movie? Um, well, it's a little hard right now because it's not, you know, we haven't got a distributor in the States. So any distributors out there in the States <laughs> listening, sure. Like give me a call. Um, it's on Red Nation. I don't know when is this, when is this podcast going up? Is it before the end of December? Uh, within the next couple of days. Okay. So Red Nation is still showing it till the end of December. So that's, and they're not geo blocking. Um, in Canada, it will be, it's, it's still, um, it's showing at the Winnipeg Aboriginal Film Festival December, in the end of December. And then in Canada, there's a channel called Crave. So it will be showing starting in early January on Crave. But in the States, we don't have, um, you know, distribution yet. The film just came out in September. Um, so it's still finding its, you know, its way into the world. We have festivals coming up, um, that I've been, we've been invited to, um, and we'll be announcing them on our Facebook page, uh, Monkey Beach, the film, and, and, um, we're trying to get our Instagram page back up, but, um, so we'll be announcing festivals in the States where it'll be screening so people could look for those. And when, when they launch sometime in January and February and such, then they'll be able to watch them probably. It depends on how these geoblock, like some of these places will geoblock just for their state or just for their province and others will let them be available, you know, um, everywhere. So it kind of depends on the deal that they have or what their plans are. So that's about the best I can suggest. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'd like to, I'd be happy just to get it on Netflix in the States. We, I can't sell to Netflix in Canada because I've already got broadcast deals. So, um, but I could try to get it on Netflix. So I guess that's the next thing. Try to get uh, the door in the door. And, you know, again, I'm being, I mean, it, it, I'm proud of being an outsider, but it's also made it a little bit harder for me in my career. Um, so I don't have the sort of like ready access to those uh, places, but I'm going to do my best to get there for this film. That's good. That's good. So your social media, it's uh, Monkey Beach on Facebook, Monkey Beach on Instagram. And I Soon. We're, we're, we, we can't get in right now, but we're working on it. Um, or, or we'll start a new one. But yeah, it's Monkey Beach on, on Facebook for sure. I think it's because I think we call it Monkey Beach the movie. Yeah, that's um, right. Because, there, because there's a Monkey Beach, a literal Monkey Beach in Indonesia that, you know, you can Google Monkey Beach and you'll come up with a whole bunch of monkeys on the beach. And it's like, no, 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 that's all. Which speaking of, which speaks to actually people always ask, well, well there's no monkeys. That's because um, it's kind of it's kind of idiom for Sasquatch. So uh, the place, the actual place where much of the story takes place, is actually called Monkey Beach. By the you know the the high school talk about this is is Monkey Beach, and um, it's because the stories of Sasquatches or Bugwas, um live there. Um, maybe they don't live there now, but two three hundred years ago, uh, the people would go there to climb. Um, you know, to do clamming and, you know, just, a, it's a beautiful place. And they would, um, the Sasquatches or Bugwas would come down from the, from the mountains and the people would have to step aside and let them get their clams and then they would leave. So it became, over time, that became, you know, euphemistically called Monkey, Monkey Beach. And there's another story which I haven't been able to confirm in which some um, newcomers in their tall ships had a monkey or a couple of monkeys aboard who got loose and procreated, but I don't think that's true. Wow, that's awesome. Nice yeah. little stories in there and yeah. powerful stories embedded in the movie. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you uh, taking time to uh, share your story and talk about the film and, and the work that you're doing. And it's, it's powerful and it, it, it made me feel good to see a movie where there's uh, Native people in it, Indigenous people, and talking about the issues that matter to us. So I do appreciate it, and I'll definitely share that movie on my social media platform. So thank you very much.
Hi, hi. It's really been, you know, wonderful to talk to you. Um, I really value, um, when our, you know, the, the good energy I've been getting back from our people about the film. Um, I, you know, in the end, that's what's the most important that, you know, our people, um, have embraced the film and, and that just, you know, makes, makes it all worth. So many years of getting here makes it all worthwhile. So hi, hi. And, you know, all my respect and, you know, um, Happy solstice and all those things to you and your and your loved ones. Thank you very much. We say in Navajo, so thank you very much. Have a good day.